Good evening. May God bless you all. To all the brothers, all the sisters, everyone who may be joining us in this live stream, it's truly a joy to be congregated, to be found here together. It's an immense joy. And how can we not say it? To see each other in this moment. Us, well, you through the screens and us feeling you as if we can see you in our hearts. Imagining all those smiles, all those happy faces, all those eyes and faces with so much happiness, knowing that we're all here with God and that God is here with us in this meeting. Let us pray to the Lord and let us give way to this sermon for him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, glorious King, we praise you. You are great and powerful. All the praise is for you, my Lord. You are the most precious treasure that we can have, my Lord. You are our riches. You are our everything in our lives, my Lord. And in this moment, we want to dedicate this time to you, to give you thanks, to praise you, because you have given us life to honor you. And we present ourselves before you, our eternal King, as, an, a, as a living offering for you. May our words reach your presence, my Lord, and may be for your joy and pleasure. Be with us. Look upon us, my Lord, and look at our intentions. Look at our joy. Look at our desire to be closer to you, to know your word, to learn of your ways. Visit us, O Lord. Send the power of your Holy Spirit. Send your heavenly fire, my Lord, that we may all feel that joy that you are here with us. We ask you, your, my Lord, for you to bless your church all over the world. We are all here. In the, your church is now in many homes, many families, in many hearts. May, we, the, may they all reach your blessings, and especially your servants, our sister Mary Luisa. May you always give her all her desires, and may you bless her greatly, and bless all your pastors. Be with us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Amen. Glory to our God. We are going to open our Bibles. We're going to be reading in the New Testament, standing as we find ourselves. I invite everyone to read in 2 Corinthians, chapter number 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. We can find this book after the Gospels, after Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John, after the Acts of the Apostles, and after 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we're going to read for the honor and glory of the Lord. We're going to pay full attention in this beautiful teaching of the Apostle Paul. Here in verse 17, it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Look how beautiful this is, what it reads. That is, that, the God, that God is in Jesus Christ. And this phrase that the, that the Sister Mary Luisa has taught us, that in that body, that humanly body named Jesus of Nazareth, was God within him, God living within him. And for what? And here in verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him, that is to say, who knew no sin, that's to say the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. With We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says... In an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 
praises to the Lord. You may take a seat, brothers and sisters. What a beautiful reading. And what a great invitation that the Lord gives us for we for us to become those ambassadors in the name of Christ, bringing that message of reconciliation, speaking to many people of this true gospel, as a sister had testified that she had invited many times her mother to the church, a woman that was, uh, was elderly, full of illnesses, and the doctors told the sister of the church, prepare yourself because your, your mother is of an older age and she has many illnesses and at any moment she can pass away. The Lord was also preparing this sister because that time was coming close, but she felt so much sadness because she would say, my, my Lord, my mother doesn't know your church. And she wanted him to, or she wanted her to. And so she always wanted her to come to church, but she, the, her mother wouldn't go to church because she was, she would hold tight to all her traditions. And the sister of the church one day came to church sadly, and she would, and the Lord spoke to her in prophecy saying, don't worry so much for, and the Lord spoke to her in prophecy saying, don't worry so much because that woman is going to come to my congregation. And when she comes, she's going to be supported by your arms. And you're going to see her in my church, learning of my ways. And she felt comforted by these words and she felt happy. But in the few weeks, the pandemic came and all the churches were closed. And she said to the Lord, Lord, your promise Where's that promise that you gave me? Time is moving forward and the church remains closed. And my mother still hasn't come to church. And she started watching the live streams in her home. She would put the live streams on the TV and she started watching them. And her mom, she says that her mom would stay in her room, but she would hear the sermons and she would say, raise the volume, raise the volume. And she started falling in love with God. And she's saying overall, she was in love with all the hymns and courses sung by our sister Mary Lisa until one Sunday before the start of the, of the live stream, the, her mother told her daughter, please help me, help me come so that I can also see the, see the live stream. And uh, so she helped her with her arms. She was supporting her and she remembered that prophecy. And she said, Lord, you have fulfilled that promise. And she recognized that the word of the Lord is faithful and true. And so she's been able to enjoy these teachings. Glory to the Lord. What a beautiful moment. And we're going to sing to the Lord this hymn we're going to, that's going to cover everything that we're, we just spoke about. The reading, the testimony here in hymn 32, The King's Business. Him 32.
our precious, your precious gospel that we are now very joyful to proclaim. Blessed is the name of the Lord forever. This beautiful message that says, as the hymn says, it's faithful message that we proclaim. And we proclaim it every time we share the teachings, all the all the links, every time we uh, activate, we say we like the video, every time we, this way, we're sharing this message, we're letting this message be known, as well through subscribing for those of you who haven't yet, also helping our family subscribe and activating the notifications, but also speaking to many people of this beautiful gift that we have, the gospel of salvation we're going to sing another hymn brothers and sisters we're going to be continue singing hymns hymn 138 titled i'll be a sunbeam hymn 138 sunbeams bright as sunbeams bright as the sun with the power of god to touch the night and turn into the most beautiful morning and to bring and bring to those souls to salvation so that they can love them love the lord as much as we love him we're going to sing choruses now but before singing choruses i invite you to pray to the lord we're going to dedicate a prayer of thanksgiving it's very important to give thanks to the Lord for everything that he gives us. But we're also going to present to him all our tithes and offerings with gratitude to the Lord and asking him to give us understanding every day so that we can fulfill this commandment, which is a commandment from God. And we're also going to ask the Lord to give us, to have mercy and to, because of this illness that we all humankind has suffered, may the Lord to shorten its time and for us to see his blessing. But above all, let us give thanks to the Lord. Heavenly Father, God of glory, owner of all things, you are the God that lives forever and ever. We are blessed 
to walk by your hand, to walk in this life under the light of your sight, my Lord. It's our joy. It's our realization to be able to see you. It's our joy. It's our happiness to live with you, my Lord. Everything that you give us, everything that we have comes from you. And we will, we don't have, nor we will we ever have all the words necessary to express to you our gratitude and our joy to, that we have you in our life. But look at our hearts and recognize, our, my Lord, that we know that you exist and that we love you. And, that rec and with that recognition of the Lord, we, at, we offer our tithes and offerings. It's of great joy for us, of much reverence, a commandment that you have taught us with its full understanding in the spiritual sense. And that way we want to understand and we want to act upon it, my Lord. Look also, my Lord, upon these times. Look, my Lord, it's been almost a year where we've been living through this great tribulation. Remember of your mercy. Remember, and we ask you, O Lord, to shorten this time because we long to congregate once again, to be able to praise you as a congregation altogether and to be congregated as your people, my Lord. Remember of your promise and have mercy, my Lord. Bless each one of us also, my God. Bless each one of us who has suffered from this, from this illness. All the family members, bring them forward, my Lord, and work wonders and miracles. We ask you this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Amen. We're going to sing choruses of praise for the Lord now. We're going to start with chorus 157, titled, From Captivity. The Lord has led us, led us from captivity, from slavery, but from, as the Bible states, He has taken captivity captive. We were once captives of evil, but now we are captives of the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Chorus 157, from captivity. O Heavenly Father, great King, what a great joy it is, what a great wonder it is to see the change that you have worked in our lives, my Lord. That great joy that we have. to bless, to transform our lives. Praises to the Lord. And there is fire in our souls. There's joy. There's happiness. God is here with us. We're going to sing one more chorus. We're going to sing the chorus number 95, which is titled, I Am Debtor for the Souls That Go Without Salvation. Let us sing with joy for the Lord. Chorus 95. Praises to you, my Lord. You are the God of our life. You are the praise that is within our mouth. Our mouth, our soul, rejoicing, my Lord, because you are great and mighty. Glory to you, my Lord. Our voices are full of joy for you, my Lord. May they all reach you because you deserve all honor and supreme praise because you're the most beautiful thing in our life. Let us pray to the glory before you, my Lord. Praise to your holy name. Sleepless night. 
all the honor and glory be always for our God. That beautiful phrase, I am here, Lord, send me. I'm here at your beck and call. And to be servants of the Lord, first we have to learn that perfect path, that perfect gospel. And it's a delight for me, brothers and sisters, to leave you in the company of the, our head pastor of the church, our brother Carlos Alberto. May the Lord bless you all. Good evening, brothers and sisters. God bless you all. Glory to the Lord for all of his mercies, all his love and his protection. Blessed is the name of our Lord. You may take your seats, please. There is a testimony that someone told me a few days ago about a family who, here in Colombia, who had to travel to go and live to a, a, one of the main cities. However, they had a, uh, a home in, in the countryside where they work the fields. And, and so they, they had a coffee field, crops. However, because of the situation that, that happened, the shortage that happened because of the pandemic, they had to go back to their countryside or their, their farm rather, and when they were there, they were saying that the only thing they had left, as the Bible says, is just a few, a few grains of coffee, a few seeds of coffee. But they did not have the fertilizer. Or, and so we all know that for the uh, coffee to be able to grow and have crops, it needs the fertilizer. It needs the chemicals that will nourish it, that will fertilize it to be able to have crops. They had a promise from the Holy Spirit during a time of shortage. God was going to help them and God was going to work a miracle. They were saying that they planted the seeds, the, the coffee seeds, but they didn't have any fertilizer and it was impossible to acquire it, to secure it. But wonderfully, the land started to produce it. And it has been abundant and bountiful. And so with the Lord and for the Lord, there's nothing impossible. Glory to the name of the Lord. We praise this almighty God and this everlasting and wonderful God who does everything for us. And every day he shows us through these miracles that the Lord is by our side. He is our comfort. As our sister Maria Luisa was teaching last Sunday, he is our comforter and also he is our strength, our everything. Hallelujah. Blessed is his name forever and ever. Let us rise and we are going to read in our Bibles. We are going to read in 1 Samuel. Let us read Read 1 Samuel. Old Testament, 1 Samuel, chapter number 8. Tonight, we are going to teach about discontentment. What is discontentment and what it consists of? Discontentment in 1 Samuel in chapter number 8. And we are going to read verse number 5 for the honor and glory of the Lord. And said to him, Look, you are old, the elders of Israel said this to Samuel, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, and he answered in verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Amen. You may take your sheets. And as I was saying, as it pertains to the meaning of discontentment, being discontent, what the Lord might tell us is do not be discontent. And prophecy, the Holy Spirit might tell us, 
not to be discontent. So it is important for us to know when is a person discontent and what does discontentment mean? It is a flaw, a sin in the sight of the Lord. It is very similar to complaining. And discontentment means that people who are discontent, they focus on questioning or this rejecting three main main aspects these are the ones we want to focus on people they question or they despise or look down on, on first the orders or commands god gives us we're going to give examples on this second people they question or they look down on not only or disregard rather not only here as as it happened here with the servant of the lord and also uh, other people and the third way to show discontentment generally speaking is that people question and disregard the lord's blessing we are going to elaborate on these three th ways of being discontent in life. Let us look at the first one, which is when people question or disregard the commands God has established, what God has outlined. In this case, which we just read, the case uh, of Samuel, it was very clear for him because God had said said it to him like that, that, that the king in the midst of the people of Israel was God himself, that he was the was God and Lord of all, all on all the people. So that was what God established. That is what God had commanded that he wanted to reign and to be king over them. But the people of Israel were discontent. Why were they discontent? Because they questioned the command of the Lord. And they did not esteem it or valued it, but rather they disregarded what God wanted, which was to reign over the people because he is our king, glory to the Lord, forever. Because he is the everlasting king, our creator. He deserves all honor. He deserves all glory. He deserves all our homage. However, the people of Israel wanted to be like the other nations because the other nations around them had, had kings. And they also wanted to do the same thing, to have the same things. Kings, human kings, and not the divine king. So when Samuel heard the elders of the people telling him this, Samuel felt very sad. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, look at what they're asking me. It can't be. And the Lord said to him, they are rejecting me. They're re they are discontent. They are questioning what I established. The people who question do not value what God has commanded. Rather, Oftentimes they attempt to know more than God and they attempt to know more than other people. And these people, these elders, had made that decision. And, and the Lord did say to Samuel, accept what they're telling you, but do tell them what is going to happen to them. And in the following verses, Samuel then taught them, Everything that was going to happen once they appointed kings, which would be very negative consequences for the people. Now, let us look at another example in 2 Kings. 2 Kings, we find here, chapter number 5, the way the Lord had given a command through the prophet Elijah when Naaman who was the general of the army of Syria and he had leper he came to look for Elisha because he was told that Elijah had power 
to heal him from his leprosy. And so Naaman imagined that Elisha was going to come out to greet him, that Elisha was going to bow down to him because he was a general of the army of Syria, a great nation. He imagined he was going to pray, call on God, Elisha was, and that he was going to be healed immediately. And in this case, what Elisha did was to send word out to the general of Syria that he should go to the river, to the Jordan River, and that there he he was to submerge and that in that way he would be healed. So what happened? What ended up happening? What did in this case Naaman do? He was very upset. He was extremely discontent and he started to question the command, which was a command from God because that's how God had determined it by the mouth of the prophet Elisha. And he started to say, well, are the, the rivers that we have in Syria not better? And he started to look at all the negatives. And that is typical in a person who is discontent and questions. They are always looking, focusing on the negatives. They're not focusing on things with, a, with an optimistic uh, or positive mindset. Oftentimes, these are spirits that come upon people into people and they make them see everything on the on the negative side on the side of failure on the side of questioning things of disregarding things of not valuing also the fact that in this case the prophet was talking and that's it if the prophet was saying that the that they should go to the jordan river that was it what else the prophet was already welcoming him what else than knowing that the prophet was sending someone with, with a message? That was enough. Well, this person didn't have, didn't understand either and didn't have a reason why to understand it because he belonged to Syria. But it is useful for us to learn, to use this as an example, just to, be, just to know that people, instead of valuing what they do, is that they, they disregard things. This is what happened. So let us read in verse number 10. And so Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Rather than saying, All right, now he's told me that my flesh is going to be restored for my leprosy, that's enough. That suffices. Because there was a centurion who was a who was Roman during the lifetime of the Lord Jesus Christ who told the Lord Jesus Christ, Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And he valued and cherished the Lord Jesus Christ, and that was his attitude. So we in life should have an attitude that is more optimistic, also an attitude of understanding things, of seeing things with a mindset that entails knowledge and maturity, that everything is a plan of God and God allows all things. And God may also be testing us through a situation like this. But ultimately, if the prophet was saying that he was going to be healed, that was enough. And the blessing laid, laid there. He should go to the Jordan River and submerge. But yet in verse 11 here we find the discontent of human being. But Naaman, it says, Naaman in the verse 11 became furious and went and it said, I said to myself, because that's almost as though he knew more than the prophet. Because that's what happens with people who are discontent. They think they know more than others. So they see all things neg on the negative side. They criticize everything. They, they bring it. They put everything down. And says, I, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. And then he added, are, are the Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than, of all, than all the waters of Israel? He even started to compare the Jordan River and disregarded, despised it, comparing it to the Damascus, the rivers in Damascus. But could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in a rage. This is the behavior of someone who is discontent. Another example of someone who is discontent with the word, the commands of the Lord. We find it in 1 Samuel 
Chapter number 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14. Or with the commands that are given by the person whom God has appointed, in this case the prophet. In King Saul's case, we're going to see an example here in 1 Samuel 14. When King Saul spoke and with all the authority he had as king, he said to the people of Israel that they should fast for they were going to go out into battle and that the best thing was to fast for God to help them during the battle and that they should not eat anything. However, his son Jonathan had not heard the command of his father, the king. When Jonathan came and he came into the battle, he took honey and it states that the honey, which is like an energi energizing thing, look at the, cal the calories found in the honey. The Bible states then that it, it, his countenance brightened and that he show, he seemed more vigorous than everyone who was fasting in the army. And he told them, how could it be possible that they were fasting for the ba before the battle? And that was Jonathan's mistake because Jonathan could have eaten the honey because he didn't know anything. However, as soon as they told him that his father had given a command, he should have just stayed silent and not say anything else. However, the, his discontent and his sin was to have spoken to the people and to say, what kind of command is this? That was his mistake. And that is what we must also be very careful when it comes to the sin of discontentment because you then start to question the commands. God gives the commands God has given through prophet Elisha, for example. The commands that he gave through the prophet Moses. The commands that he gave through the king, who was the one who yielded, who wielded the authority, in this case Saul. And when the person who is discontent and begins to talk and to question and does so publicly, he affects other people and makes them sin because other people will then start to hear and then people will start to analyze what this person who is discontent is saying and then it contaminates their, their mindset. They won't have a spiritual mindset any longer to say, all right, if the command God that our king gave us was to fast, we're going to follow it and God is going to help us. Even, even if we're hungry, God is going to be with us. That should be the spiritual mindset. And even, even if the command towards someone might be, humanly speaking, incorrect, but that command must be cherished and respected. And oftentimes God may allow in this case, the king, Saul, to issue that command to test the people and to see how they were going to take things. And also to punish them. Because by the time people begin to question, look at how, wrong, how bad everything turned. Look at this failure. Look at why was this decision made. And I'm, I just remembered a passage where the people of Israel were the, were the rulers who were with Joshua, but they made a mistake with people who were from Gibeon and Gibeon, and they they were deceived, and all the people started to speak and say, "How is it possible that they made this mistake? And how could it be possible that they allow them to to be tricked?" So all those comments in public. They are comments that contaminate other people and it becomes a sin. So it's different when you analyze it, but yet you say, all right, I'm going to support it and I'm going to do it because that's where a, a mature person does because God might be testing us just as he, it, there is our, there, therein lies our blessing because the words that are being uttered by the Matthew prophet, therein lies the, prof, the blessing, therein lies the blessing. And so here it teaches us in, for, in verse number 27, but Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb. But 
and put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. Then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people, meaning Saul, the people with an oath saying, cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. They were very hungry. But they told him, your dad was the one who issued this command. But Jonathan said, my father has traveled the land. Just imagine like that and publicly. My father has traveled the land. So that's discontentment. That's him questioning things and doing so publicly. Look, now how my countenance has brightened. Look, and he, he, he made them look. They were hungry. And he said, look, my countenance. countenance it's not that they became in a different color. It's just an expression to say it because he was revitalized. Just because he, he ate a little bit of the honey. Because I tasted a little bit, a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today and of the spoil of their enemies? Meaning he questioned the command and that was his mistake. His attempting to know more than his father and make it uh, public. Now we're going to see other examples when... People question and disregard the servants of God also, more along the lines of what we've been explaining, and generally speaking, people. And not insofar as the commands themselves, but more so broadly speaking when it comes to the work they, that they do. Let us read Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Here we find... The teaching, the lesson in verse number 16, which the Lord Jesus Christ taught here to his disciples in verse number 16. That he didn't understand how could it be that people had lacked understanding and that they were questioning everything and that they were discontent and negative negative minded and they couldn't see any anything positive in anything and this is beautiful to think really when people truly have stability and an optimistic mindset when people analyze analyze things with balance and when they're always looking for the spiritual sense as to why things are happening and they give thanks to God and they give the Lord glory and they are they, they feel happy with the Lord that's something beautiful but when a person is always having negative th thoughts or quarreling, discontent, arguing, and harboring har envy. That's a sad thing because then the spiritual life of this person becomes ruined. When someone's acting like that so negatively and so with so much discontent and always questioning and disregarding things, that person's spiritual life becomes ruined and spirits may come inside him that will make the person even turn even more negative and even worse. So that person will not be able to have spiritual peace, will not be able to have harmony with other people. He will not be able truly to move forward in the spiritual life. And he will also harm other people because the other people who are heard, hearing him will be contaminated. And that person will then begin, be, become tares in the church because... Everything that he talks affects people because he says so publicly. He doesn't think it through or he doesn't approach or ask. I have this question. I'm concerned about this. This is my point of view. Could you explain? That should be the, the correct approach. But he does so openly. And he doesn't care who might be listening. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, This generation, I, I cannot understand it because... We play the flute for you and you do not dance. Because that's a lot that's logical. If they're playing the flute, then people will begin to dance. If people are mourning and crying, then people will start to lament. Verse number 17. That's what's logical. It makes sense. It just makes sense. John the Baptist came, verse 18, who neither ate nor drank, and they said he is a demon. Because he was a man who was who did not eat or drink 
in that manner, in that fashion. So he said, oh, he has a demon. And then the Son of Man came, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who ate and drank. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber. And also they criticized him, telling him that he was a friend of tax collectors or sinners. Because you might remember the passage in Luke 18, I believe, Luke 19, which teaches us about Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector, the people who collected taxes back then, and the Lord Jesus Christ rewarded him because this man went up to a tree and he was asking the Lord and and the Lord said I'm gonna go and dwell in your household Zacchaeus and everyone who were around him rather than looking at it, that and valuing it they were only look, focusing on the uh, negative oh hey look at him he's going out there to visit Zacchaeus who is someone who lives you know who leads a sinful life a tax collector look at him so they were always looking at things that way negatively everything was terrible everything was the worst nothing was good nothing had been accomplished everything was chaotic there was nothing positive nothing good come out of it everything was there was everything was wrong with it no 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 instead we should say how beautiful john the baptist look at the example john the baptist is giving us he doesn't eat he doesn't drink how beautiful all the things that he does look at the lord jesus christ he stays, he came to give healing and salvation to the sinners. How beautiful. It all comes from a plan of God. How wonderful the Lord is. Look at the way God proceeds. And that should be the way with everything. The same thing like that. Rather, they're always having that discontent and negative negativity and always burdened with that discouragement because that truly discourages people. Whoever is negative-minded, in the end, they are, they become discouraged. And there's, they're not only discouraged themselves, but they discourage everyone around them. And if people who are around the, that person are not steadfast and have no spiritual maturity, have no knowledge of the Word of God, they are also going to be affected and they're also going to become negative. So no, no, we must say, well, there are positive things here. Not everything's wrong. There's something good here. And there is. And I'm sure we're going to find it because we have a spiritual mindset. We're going to find those positive things. In Acts 7, verse 35, the Bible teaches us what they did with Moses. That... When it came to Moses, they also questioned him and they rose up against him saying to him, who appointed you as judge and ruler? And they defied him rather than seeing him, rather than looking at everything God had spoken and all the things God did through Moses, they defied him because he was the person God had appointed as their prophet in their midst and verse 35 states this moses whom act 7 whom they rejected there it is they rejected him they questioned what they did what he did they criticized him they put down everything moses did they disregarded him they spiced him who made you a ruler and a judge they even said to him it's the one God sent to be a ruler. He said, I mean, they were talking about him, the discontent towards the people God has appointed to serve him, a servant of his. It's the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer. God had sent him to this by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. So it wasn't because of his choosing. Someone might say today, but why are the pastors in the church not changed Every year, why don't you give an opportunity, another chance like that? There are people who have said this in the church who come and say, hey, why don't you just rotate and you just have a pastor, a new pastor every year? But So these are people who make other people think, hear those types of comments or become affected and they sort of to say, well, why is it? But the person who has maturity, who has knowledge says, no, because 
God is the one who appoints people. And that is the, uh, he, through prophecy, he makes some promises and then he fulfills those promises. And as long as the person does not fail God and does not commit sins that are, you know, grave before the Lord, God is going to help them so they, serve, so they can serve him until their death if they're faithful to God. So that is the reality that today happens also. And so it states here that God sent him as deliverer and ruler by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush, meaning no one chose Moses in an assembly or uh, they didn't vote for him in the midst of the people of Israel, but God himself manifested himself in the bush and said, take the rod and start to work miracles. And no one could work the miracles that Moses worked because God had sent him out to do that job. So, we every day we must acquire knowledge that we are not confused. Also, we must respect our brothers and sisters and people because you might also be someone who is discontent towards someone else. And so we should ask God to remove that from us so that we are not discontent with one another against brothers and, the sister, brothers and sisters, believers, even if they don't hold any responsibilities in the church. But if someone is attending the church, you should always look, think like this. If this person's in the church, it's because God loves him. If that person's in the church, it is because God brought him. If he is in the church, it is because God had mercy on him and he is important to God. Also, for people in the world, even if they haven't come to church, we must respect them and value them and appreciate them and esteem them. Respect people very much, even if they don't come to the church. So, here in James, the Bible states that we should not complain with one another when it states, speak ill. That speaking ill is more like criticizing each other or one another. Like, um, rejecting or disregarding one another because when it comes to this there's also complaining yes but there's a type of complaining against people whom God appointed to do something for instance if someone made a comment against our sister Mary Louisa whom God appointed to lead the church since the beginning the person who gave the first prophecy if someone ever speaks Ill, evil or questions a sermon or to disregard it and to make comments about it, that term becomes a type of complaint against God. It states here, speaking evil though, uh, meaning questioning one another. And then verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren, meaning criticize each other. <laughs> Criticizing one another he who speaks evil of a brother judges his brother, speaks evil of the law, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not doer of the law, but a judge. Because the law, the law says that we must love one another. And then that's where respect lies. And that's where valuing one another lies. And not questioning one another. We should not question one another. We should all respect each other. Instead, pray for brothers and sisters. Or if someone asks us for our opinion, we give them our opinion. If they don't, we respect them. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who? The Lord. Who are you to judge another? And there is a passage in Ecclesiastes where you see the tendency in human beings. Because the truth is, someone was ta ta telling me, people in this country, they, they don't like anything. They, they were telling me. They question everything. They criticize everything. For example, when it comes to root, to the God, the per, the person who are the leaders, political leaders, they he does something and they don't like it. Nothing. They, they find nothing good. Everything is bad. Everything is terrible. Everything they do is worse. The ruling class and that they made that comment to me, and I found this passage in the Bible where you see that this is the human nature: ungrateful, discontent. They don't find use in anything. They're never complete with what they have. They always want more. They're always filled with selfish greed, with selfish ambition. They never can't say, oh, that's nice. 
what you did was good, was nice, and acknowledge someone, someone, something someone did, but they always try to attack him and to reject him, disregard him, despise him, to be discontent, to have, make bad comments and destruction. That is something typical of human beings, and it states here, Solomon said that this is vanity also in human beings, and that back then he gave an example which was that when the successor of the king comes, then what he will find it will also be criticism and evil comments because no one is happy with anything. So this can't be the people of God can't behave like that. That is ugly, unpleasing. A person who is not content with anything criticizes everything, puts down, puts everything down, criticizes everything, everything is negative, everything is the worst, there's nothing good, and he, he doesn't receive anything good. And then people become filled with that feeling and that mindset. But that is what it is what it is. So if there is a day when someone criticizes you, then you should not feel so sad because the Bible says that that's the way it is. And that's human nature, but it shouldn't be like that. And that's why we're in the church seeking God for God to help us so that we do not make those mistakes. And it states here in verse 15, I saw all the living walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place, meaning the king, the successor of the king. 16, there was no end of all the people over whom he was ma whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Meaning the successor will must know that they were not going to be happy with him. And that applies to the government. So the new government that they they voted in in any nation, some, there's, will, they will find something wrong in him. And they that's the only thing that's sure. That's how people are. And that's how human beings are, this content. So, how beautiful is it to find people who are objective, who have a balanced outlook? Well, they say this is negative, this is positive, but there are more, more, positive than, more positives than negatives. Now, God is allowing this nonetheless, and this is a plan of God, and this is nice, and in the midst of this, we've received these blessings, and God is with us, and we have learned a lot. So... And someone who analyzes things like that maturely, it is what God is, expects from us that we have that we are objective, that we uh, subjective that, that we're not subjective, always not always having discontent or not always wanting to be wise and that we are the ones who know no one knows anything, no one does anything good. No. So we should correct this behavior and in that way God will be with us. And the third way of what we're saying tonight, which is about discontentment, it is when we question and disregard a blessing of God. In Exodus 16, you find the people of Israel, the people of God in antiquity, rejecting the Lord's blessing. Exodus 16 Version number two, it states, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. It, it says that they were better off in Egypt. Oh, in Egypt we were doing wonderfully. In Egypt we used to sit down by the pots of meat. Imagine that. They were slaves. The Bible says that they worked hours on end, without on end, that they were heavily taxed to tire them and make them feel fatigued and destroyed. And yet they prefer to be like that, slaves, rather than seeing the wonders of God, the great deeds of God as they walk towards the land that God promised them. How discontent, such neg negativity, what this human nature that is so away from God. So it says that, oh, we used to sit by the pots of meat when we ate bread to the full. Imagine that. 
But th- it wasn't like that. They were slaves, but they thought this, their slavery was better than what they were now living. Everything upside down. Like God is blessing us and they're saying, no, no, God doesn't bless us. And then we're doing terribly. We receive nothing from God. Everything's bad. And we're surrounded by blessing. No, no, bad, bad, bad. No, we've received nothing from God. Meaning we don't see, we don't, you don't see the blessing. Then in verse number 14, it states that God sent him manna. And then manna was something, it states in verse number 14, the layer like, uh, you know, round, small thing, or fine as frost uh, on the ground. But, and that's the bread he sent him. And later on, then in Numbers 21, they were, you find him complaining about their, about manna. Even though God on that day, sent them bread and they could not eat them anymore because they had so much bread the quails and then afterward they had manna but it was thin fine and then later on they were complaining that they didn't like that bread that was so fine so small that's the discontent from human beings no nope, they didn't like bread that bread any longer so god gave him a, gave someone a car and so the car on a given day had a mechanical failure and he complains. Well, that's a blessing God gave you. He promised you a job and you're doing poorly perhaps with a co-worker. And then you start to complain about your job. Or your boss admonished you or, or scolded you and then you start to complain about your job. And everything is bad like that and so on and so on. God is blessing them and everything is bad. Nothing's good. And... It states here, Numbers 21, verse number 4, that the people, they they became very discouraged. They became discouraged, and then in verse 5 states, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So after they saw that God opened the the sea and have, that God worked so miracles, there is... No food, no water, and are so loathed. Just imagine that. They loathed this worthless bread. They loathed it. They hated it. And they said, oh, that bread. That's the way they spoke. Oh, we loathed it. We hated it in front of everybody. Imagine their discontent in front of everybody. For other people who were weaker and to say, oh, he loathed it. Yeah, I also loathe it because I hate it too. Because there are people who become very easily influenced. There are people who are just starting to learn. With a comment like that, then it, their lives are destroyed. Their spiritual lives come to an end. And then Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible teaches us, or allow me, let's read Deuteronomy 1 instead, which teaches us that they send someone out to see the promised land. In Deuteronomy, chapter number 1, verse 21, they sent out to see the promised land, and they sent tw- Moses sent 12 spies that they should go out and look at it to see how the promised land was. And they brought grapes, they said, that were gigantic. And they brought the, pr- the proof that it was indeed a very fruitful land. But no, their negativity no, then no and no. And they said, and the, the 12 that came back, then Caleb and Joshua were the ones who were very positive. And they said, no, that's the blessing of God. And then there were others who said, no, there are giant men over there. And there are well, cities behind walls. It's impossible. So they discouraged the others. So they started to question the blessing of God, because God was blessing them. And then Moses told them, do you think it less that on the day, during the daytime, God gave us a pillar of smoke to guide us through the wilderness? If God did that, do you think he's not going to give us victory? At night, he gave us a pillar of fire. And yet you think the Lord is not going to give us triumph. You all, always speaking well and good of God. I highlight that of our Sister Maria Luisa. Sister Maria Luisa is always coming to the defense of God. And he, she all, in her, all her teachings and all her advice, she only speaks good of the Lord and says, God is right. What is happening is because of this and that. But God is right. 
God is to be respected. We cannot question him. God is blessed. The Lord is perfect. He knows why he does this. But never, never does she speak ill. Never does she question him. Why does, did God allow it? Never. But rather, God is perfect. God is right. That is our blessing. That is for us to learn. That is a great lesson. Always. What's the positives? Always praising God and admiring him. You can find it there. All the explanation of what we are highlighting in the situation that took place. And now in Hebrews chapter 12, there's another example of discontentment when it, com when it came to a blessing from God. In this case, from Esau. Because God had said, my blessing is for for he who is the firstborn. And this was not a blessing for him. It was like a curse, actually. Like the, he it had no no value. Meaning he disregarded the blessing of God so much so that he, gave, he turned it in for a plate of food. So he questioned it. He questioned the blessing of God. He didn't appreciate it. He didn't steam the blessing of God. It is in Hebrews 12, verse number 15. It says, Looking carefully, lest anyone shall fall short of the, of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. A root of bitterness, it's also that. That negativity, questioning, criticizing, everything's negative, all the discontent, complaining disregarding the things of God, the commands of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord, people who God has appointed, other people, brothers, sisters, people outside. That is the root of bitterness. Lest any root bitter, bitterness and cause trouble, it says. But not only trouble, spiritual trouble, but also many become defiled and many uh, be, see their spiritual lives affected, which is the parable of the tares and the wheat. The, they are there, the weed and the tares, and they all become intertwined. And so it says, Lest there be any fornicator, profane person like Esau, who wants to defame, the, the, like Esau, it says, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. And for that reason, it states that he re regretted it, but even though he cried, he was not able to attain it. May God help us. So that we do not make this mistake on the, op the opposite. May we have spiritual maturity and be people who always admire everything God allows us in life before it will be for the, good, for the better glory to the Lord. Let us rise. Blessed Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all your blessings, for your love and kindness. For everything that you allow us to live, for everything that you have allowed in our lives to for everything that happens to us and all the things that have come to our lives. Everything's for our blessings. Everything's for our lessons. Everything is for the better. Everything is a perfect path you have set out for each of us. That we want you to manage our lives and that you guide us. That you do your will and that you, O oh Lord, handle our existence. And that you, Lord, are the one in charge of doing everything according to your purpose, your plan in every life, so that in that way our spiritual lives may be strong and not contaminated, so that evil spirits won't come to destroy your spiritual lives, but rather that we will be delivered and be optimistic, happy, joyful, and in peace with you, in peace with our neighbors, and that we also have the mindset that is inspired, a mind that is clear to understand and comprehend with wisdom all things, and thus may we conduct ourselves. May you set us free from witchcraft, sorcery, curses, the envy of the devil, dangers of death and dangers, perils of accidents, any kind of harm that may come upon our lives, the plottings and schemings of the devil. May you preserve our health, our lives from spirits of, of illness and, and weakness, and of illness, the virus that is looming around human beings. May you set us free from this virus and may you give us good health 
that we may serve you vitality and and may we have vigor to serve you to speak to many people of your manifestation of your glory and that many people may know of you O lord and also lord may you keep our households our marriages in unity respect harmony with our children our families lord May you, O oh God of glory, bless our spiritual life, our material life, our financial life. May you provide everything that we need, O oh Lord, so that we may, O oh God of glory, comply with all our commitments and enjoy your material blessing as well. Blessed God, we ask you for your blessing to your church upon our sister Maria Luisa with the fullness of your power and your protection upon all your children worldwide in all countries and all nations where they are logging in with one heart hear their request the special request they present before you and ask grant, grant them what they ask you may you glorify yourself and be magnified and may you work with power and may you give us victory may you guide us and pro always protect us from failing you and committing sins, and thus may we always have fellowship with you. Deliver us from temptation, O Lord, from falling from uh, any mistakes, so that in that way you may always reply to our requests, to our pleads to you. Thank you, beloved God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Blessed is the name of the Lord. We are going to sing Chorus 142, I am joyful every moment. the name of the Lord. Blessed is our God. Brothers and sisters, this was joy to share with you this time. Big hug. May the Lord bless you and keep you. So long. Mm -hmm.